Welcome to Novel Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. This is Mike Consul. Hello, and thank you for joining the program. I'm going to say what I have to say and hope that in no way I am besmirching the reputation of John Irving, the great novelist John Irving, whose work I greatly admire. And in fact, one of his books in particular played a really important role in my own development as a writer. Before I get to that, I'm going to go back in time and lead up to John Irving and his uh, seminal piece of work in my life. So I go back to my childhood, to my youth, when I was playing a lot of basketball, and I had the ambition to become an NBA basketball player. An NBA star was the hope. And... By and by, like so many other people who have dreams of being professional athletes, I realized I was never going to be good enough to make it there. It was during my high school years that I decided not only was I going to make the NBA, but I I was never going to be a star point guard or shooting guard for a major uh, college basketball program, say Duke or UCLA or Kentucky or Connecticut, or any number of schools that were powerhouses at the time. So I decided the next best thing for me would be to become a sports writer, because as a sports writer, I'd be able to attend NBA games and other sporting contests, because I was and am a a sports fan in general. It's not just uh, the NBA basketball. It's just it's not just basketball. I love basketball, but I love other sports, and basketball is my favorite sport to play. It's the one that I excelled at, and um, so I decided I'd go to college. I'll take take journalism classes. I'll major in journalism, become a sports writer, and I'll be able to be associated with the sports that I love and write stories about them and interview the professional athletes who populate those professional leagues. But when I went to college, which was Arizona State University, talk about a major college program, a major sports program there, although they haven't done well in recent years, I'm sad to say, in any of the sports really. I not only majored in journalism, I minored in political science. And uh, in minoring in political science, I fell in love with politics. And I decided, you know, sports is great and I can always be a sports fan, but politics is really more important than sports because it really affects people's lives in a significant way. So I'm going to be a political writer, not a sports writer. And along the way there, while I was in college, I was thinking of myself as a newspaper writer. And for reasons I can't totally explain, I saw myself as capable of being a newspaper writer, but not a magazine writer, because magazine writing was a higher level. Magazine writing was the ability to write with a skill and a creativity that was beyond me, that was a higher a higher grade than what you get at newspapers. At least this is how my thinking went. So I moved on through my college years, and it was really towards the end of my college years and my skill level and my own creativity developed to the point where I thought, you know, I can be a magazine writer. I can't, I I don't have to be just a newspaper writer. I could evolve into a magazine writer, maybe not the most literary magazines in the country. I don't know about something like the New Yorker, which is probably the toughest magazine in the country to be a writer for, but I wasn't thinking in those terms anyway. I was thinking more like Time Magazine and Newsweek Magazine, U.S. News and World Report. These are magazines that obviously, and they were much stronger back in that day than they are today, but they covered politics, something I was very interested in. 
So I thought maybe I would work my way up to a magazine writer. I was capable of it now. And I had just graduated college and I was thinking in my head that the next level beyond that, of course, was writing novels. But that was beyond me, too. That was a, a you know, magnitudes beyond being a magazine writer. A novelist was just taking the writing to a skill level and a level of creativity and storytelling that was beyond what a magazine writer would be capable of. And so I was happy to be thinking in terms of working my, my way into a position on a magazine, even as the novel was beyond me. But it was in somewhere between my early and mid twenties, right in that range there, sometime between the age of 22 and 25. And I was reading novels and nonfiction books. And then I ran across one in particular that was written by John Irving. I don't even know how it landed in my hands, whether it was recommended to me, whether I bought it on a whim, whether it was uh, just a hot book at the time. Of course, it's never stopped being hot. I'm, of course, talking about the world according to Garp. And I started reading the world according to Garp, and I was captivated by it. And I read it aggressively. I sat down every night and I read my way right through that book. And I was no more than halfway through it before in my own mind, I said to myself, I can write this, I can do this. I can be a novelist. I'm capable of this. I didn't feel that with any of the other novels that I had read. But for whatever reason, and actually I, I've got some insights into that, I think, although I don't know that I understand it 100%. The world, according to Garp, really spoke to me on that level that I can do this, that that's the kind of writing I'm capable of, where other novels were filled with writing that I didn't really feel, that I felt were beyond, that was beyond me. And this is why I say I don't want to in any way diminish or besmirch the reputation of John Irving, because it almost sounds as though I'm saying, well, his writing in the world, according to Garp anyway, was so simplistic and so lower level that even a guy like me, an inexperienced fella in my early to mid twenties could turn out a book like that. But it wasn't really that way at all. You know, what was it about The World According to Garp that really lit my fire? I, I, I can't say 100%, but I can tell you this, that there was, a, there was a simplicity to the writing, but not simplicity in the sense of uns unsophistication. It was not sophomoric by any stretch. It was that there were these relationships between Garp and his mother and Garp and his wife and his children and there was great dialogue. And I remember that John Irving in that book used lots of parentheticals. He would interject through these parentheticals uh, points that he wanted to make. And he did that repeatedly. He used a lot of italics as well, uh, which was you know, neither here nor there. It was just the style that he used in that particular book. And it was simply written in a manner that was certainly not unsophisticated and actually exceeded so many of the other novels I had read because it gave me an interest level in the book that was not achieved with most of the novels that I had read previously. And the colorfulness of the characters was something that also stood out. And the ability to track the story, there are a lot of novels that are not necessarily all that penetrable, but John Irving, particularly, and I've read, his, I've read several of his other novels. Another one of my favorite is The Fourth Hand, which is really, which is really not your typical John Irving novel, but a great novel. Again, The Fourth Hand is the one I'm referring to uh, with the protagonist, Patrick Wallingford. But the ability to track the story with the world according to Garp, he limited the number of characters, he made them vivid, he, the interaction between them 
was was so standout and so relatable that I used the word captivated early, and that's what it did. It captivated me. And it didn't just captivate me. It captivated millions of readers around the world. And I, I do believe that was John Irving's breakout novel. I mean, he wrote many other great ones after that. Most John Irving fans that I talk to say A Prayer for Owen Meany is, is best. I don't know if that's true. There's never going to be a John Irving book that's going to mean more to me than the world according to Garp because of what it meant to me, because it got me past this hurdle, this uh, one might say mental mental barrier that uh, I was not capable of being a novelist. Well, John Irving disabused me of that limitation. Not only was that read by millions of people, not only was it a celebrated novel, but it was also made into a movie a bad movie, I must say. <laughs> like uh, so many movies that are made after books, I did not like that Robin Williams was was cast as as uh, as Garp because Garp was uh, Robin Williams was not macho enough to be Garp, and uh, there was also John Lithgow in that movie. I remember, um, but the point being that. All it takes is a, is a particular piece of work, a particular novel that can be a turning point for us. And then even if, even if we're writing, even if we've already become a person who's working on a novel, another piece of work can come along that does something important for us. So as an example, Beyond the World According to Garp, what was another one? And this is this is this is a topic I'll take on in a separate podcast, but White Noise by Don DeLillo was landmark for me. Landmark. And so was American Tabloid by James Elroy, which is just an, an absolutely kick ass cool book. And the writing uh is exhilarating. But I digress briefly, there is that special place that the world according to Garp will always have in my life and my writing life and my reading life because of what it did for me. Then that's just a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing when an author can write something that inspires us to another level of thinking, inspires us to reach beyond where we are and to believe in ourselves. And that's what John Irving did for me. And we, in particular with The World According to Garp, none of his other books necessarily would have done that. None of his other ones that I've read, like Hotel New Hampshire and uh, The Cider House Rules and uh, even The Fourth Hand did that for me. It could have done that for me. I mean, Garp had already done it for me. That was the first of his books that I read. So very special it was, and it was the actual nature of that book that allowed it to occupy that role for me. So John Irving, if you're out there listening, if you happen to run across this podcast and you're listening, I'd love to have you on the program. I'd love to talk to you about this and other topics. You're a hard guy to reach. I know you're a busy guy. I don't even know if you do this kind of stuff anymore. But I'd very much like to uh, be in touch. My email address is in the episode notes, John. All you have to do is reach out to me. I'm reachable. And would love to have you on the program to talk about whatever you would like to talk about. This is my counsel for Novelist Spotlight. As always, thank you for listening. <laughs>